This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Welcome to Island Treasures, a place for caregivers to hear encouragement from other caregivers who, by sharing their experiences, offer helpful information and resources for your caregiving journey. This podcast is brought to you by Alongside Caregiver Consulting, and I am your host and caregiver consultant, Alison Van Shee from beautiful Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. Today's guest joins me from the Pacific Northwest and has a compelling story to share. When he learned of changes in his mother's behavior and cognitive abilities, he planned to travel to investigate her well-being. However, in 2005, before he could get there, Hurricane Katrina struck and completely destroyed her home and accelerated his plans. This led to her relocation to North Carolina and turned him into a long-distance caregiver all while juggling his own work commitments. When he stepped into caregiving, he never imagined that it would lead him to what he is doing today. So let's hear more directly from Bill Cohen. Welcome, Bill. It's so lovely to have you join me on the Island Treasures podcast today. I am honored to be with you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So, Bill, let's get started with your caregiving story. Great. Appreciate that. What I'd like to uh, say is that if you would ask me about almost 20 years ago, what was going to happen with my mother? What was going to transpire? And that I'd be sitting here talking to you today and doing what I do, I'd say you're crazy. There's no way you could predict this. So I, I live in Portland, Oregon. I'm originally from New England in the States. My mom had moved down to Biloxi, Mississippi. And she was living there almost 30 years with my late stepfather. So around 2004 or so, she's starting to show some signs of something. We weren't sure what, but paranoia, agitation, definitely some memory loss. Uh, She was not taking care of the house, not taking care of the finances. And we were thinking, okay, maybe she's just getting older. She's just stressed. She's tired. But we were wondering if he passed away or went into a care community, would she bounce back? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we never got that opportunity because what happened on the Gulf Coast and New Orleans in August 2005? Hurricane Katrina. Right. The home they had lived in, which she fully expected to come back to because she always had, they had evacuated safely was completely gone, swept away in the storm surge down to the foundation. There were just a few things left around the area. Most of it ended up in the back bay. Mm. That was the day that basically changed our family's life, step family and my family. Yeah. She evacuates to North Carolina with step family. I started doing the cross-country travel and long-distance caregiving. I'll tell you a quick story, which I think illustrates to a lot of people what, if they're not familiar, how severe dementia can affect people. Within a couple of days after the storm and they had arrived in North Carolina, she's out in the driveway trying to exit seek, take off, because she didn't have a very good relationship with my stepbrother. Won't get into that. But. Fortunately, another family member got her on the phone and said, Sheila, my mother's name, if you don't get back in that house, you may end up somewhere you don't want to be. 
meaning like institutionalized. She got that message, goes back in the house. I get on the next available plane. I was planning on going very soon anyway. I arrive, she's happy to see me, she's calm. And I say to my mom, I don't use the term therapeutic or white lie. I like the term compassionate deception. In other words, I wasn't telling her the whole truth. I wasn't doing any harm. I was doing in her best interest. Mom, tomorrow we're going to go see a new doctor. Oh, okay, that sounds good. We were going to the emergency department at mm. the local hospital. That day, which was about 10 hours, was the hardest emotional day of my life. Okay. Most of it we spent until the geriatric physician could see her. We were in an adjoining conference room. My mom was like a caged animal. The anguish, the fear, the, the, uh, the agitation on her face, the stress was just impalpable. I, did, I barely recognized my dear mother. Mm. Fortunately, after so many hours, they admit her, they get her on some medication, calm her down. The next day, I go see her, get off the elevator. She sees me coming and she says, there you are. There's my savior. Oh. She didn't want to be mad at me. No. It's a disease. Yeah, yeah. Really, really scary. So fortunately, we got her the care that she needed and very soon after into a care facility. Uh, along with that, I'm working full-time in Oregon. And I'm like I said, I'm doing the uh, cross-country travel and long-distance caregiving. I start attending a support group. I mm -hmm. start uh, talking to a care facility here in Portland that I'd heard only good things about. And after she then went down to Florida for a bit with her sister, I moved her, moved her out to Oregon. And she was in Southwest Portland. She ended up in that care facility. I'll tell you another quick story. Uh, she made a pre-flight with my aunt, uh, my other aunt. Uh, to visit she didn't she wasn't fighting it she wanted to be near me she wanted to come out here which was nice because you were her savior exactly there you go well I don't use that term again, <laughs> other than that story <laughs> uh, I bring her to that care facility we go into the assisted living side beautiful lobby you know like a lot of these places are and she says this is nice I could live here Bill can I afford it another compassionate deception Yes, mom. I knew she was running out of money. Mm. If she could afford, if they, it would admit her and she could afford it. I, that's where I wanted her. And they did. And they said, we don't think she'll be on this side of the street for even a year. And that's what happened. About 10 months later, she, during a norovirus quarantine, coincidentally, very similar to what we've been dealing with, but localized, she starts exit seeking. She starts mm -hmm. doing dangerous behaviors. She has to go into a um, into twenty four seven care basically. So and she ran out of money at that exact moment. Oh. So it was like the perfect storm. Yeah. So we moved her over to memory care. Uh, she was four years in memory care, and she passed away uh, at eighty three. Oh. And that was ten and a half years ago. Oh. I will say that this uh, building looked like the old nursing homes. It's been since renovated. It's beautiful now, but it looked like the old old nursing homes as we conceived them. But the care was excellent. I use, use the example that the head nurse, who's still a friend today, was there 35 years before she retired. And there were other people like that. There's still people there that knew my mother. So no turnover, low turnover. Exactly. Because they, they took good care of their people. They promoted them. They recognized them and trained, et cetera. And so, it was a quality place for them. Yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, that, that's scarce these days. So uh, what happened after that is I continued going to the support group because other people had helped me go through my own journey. A few months later, the facilitator at the time said, I have to leave. I have to let it go. Is, is somebody else interested in taking over the group? Everybody uh, looked at me. <laughs> if I had filled in a couple of times. Yeah. And I said, wait a minute, I need to know what I'm getting into here, what training, what support, but et cetera. But I thought about it. I've been a facilitator for meetings. I've been through the whole story. I might as well give it a try. Mm -hmm. And so 
after eight years of attending, and now 10 years later, same group, I'm still facilitating it. And I do another one. Perfect. Right. I also got involved with our Alzheimer's Association. I know it's Alzheimer's Society there uh, north of the border. Mm -hmm. And with uh, fundraising, with advocacy at the Capitol, things like that. And I thought I was just going to do more of that once I retired from my completely unrelated job with the state of Oregon. But I came across this concept of a caregiving support consultant. And to make a long story short, what I like to say is I turned my loss, my pain, into my passion and encore career. Nice. I found my purpose. I found my why. Because yeah. that job that I used to have for 25 years, that wasn't fulfilling. That wasn't yeah. satisfying. No. This is. It put you in a position where you could do this, though. It exactly. prepared you for that. Exactly. Um, Bill, you spoke about how you started attending a support group. Could you share how you found that and, and what led you to reach out to a support group? Because a mm -hmm. lot of folks don't, and they find them too late, or they find mm -hmm. them later on. Mm -hmm. Good question. And that is true. A lot of people don't do that. Uh, I think they're concerned about opening up among strangers, uh, even though you have that the confidentiality, the anonymity, that type of thing. Uh, mine was through the Alzheimer's Association, and I was getting other information about resources and uh, advice and research and what is Alzheimer's? What do I do? What are the treatments? Which is a whole other story because that's uh, as far as how people interact with our healthcare systems is a whole another subject, which we can, of course, talk about. So again, it was a really good uh, experience or else I might have just walked away when mom passed away. Mm. But I'm so glad that I did. And I uh, do another group, which is not just monthly, but it's weekly. Oh, wow. Fortunately, the care facility is right across the street where I do that. And we alternate between in-person and virtual because people during the pandemic were going online looking for support. And I have people joining me on the virtual from Massachusetts to Hawaii and a lot of places in between. And I can't cut them off. I no. mean, they're they're part of the extended family or group, uh, that type of thing. So they're not there, obviously, on the in-person. Right. And the, the in-person people are a part of the virtual and the in-person? Right, when they choose to be, exactly. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I like to say is, uh, and this is the way it was with the group that I first attended, some are specialized, like men only, adult mm -hmm. children, LGBTQ, et cetera. My groups have always been and always will be all ages, all genders, all relationships, all types of dementia and all stages. And we have from 30 somethings to 80 somethings and they all support each other, which is very heartwarming and gratifying. But it's, again, it's confidential. It's getting advice. People have been there, again, all stages, some are towards the end, some are just starting and they just help each other out, which is wonderful. And people like to say, I learn something new every time I come. I hear at least one little tidbit because we go around the room and do introductions to start off, especially when we have new people. And that's the thing that's said the most. Why do I come? Because I learn something new every time. Yeah. That's that's really heartwarming to me. I I share that passion for support groups with you. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that there's a caregiver language that is spoken at support groups. And there is a love and a concern, and, and it's mm -hmm. just a, a very rich experience. We have also different stages of dementia represented in our support group. And mm -hmm. we had one fellow come, and his wife was just in early stages. And we were all so worried about him hearing what things are like as the disease progresses. And we wanted to cocoon him. We wanted to protect him. And he was just saying, no, I want to learn. I want to know. Sadly, this is years further along now, and uh, he's experiencing those things that the group was experiencing when he first started. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's interesting uh, that I, I used, I've said this many years ago, that as things were going along to the extent that I read stuff, and I didn't immerse myself completely because I'm going through it, but I wanted to know what are the symptoms, what to expect, what are the stages, things like that. And in some respects, it was fascinating if you can take a step back. Mm. It was gut-wrenching, 
But it was also fascinating to see this progression and say, oh, that's happening now. Okay, what's next? What's yeah. next? Right. So I did educate myself, may informed with a lot of help from that support group. There are things that I heard 18 years ago. I'm still saying, hey, you make a mistake, don't worry about it. An hour later, the next day, you can start all over again, right? <laughs> yeah, so many people. We had one fellow as well. He'd been told by his doctor that he needed a support group years ago when his mm -hmm. wife went into care. He didn't know where to find one. The ones that were available through the government weren't what he needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually this other fellow in invited him and uh, he's been coming ever since. And he's a real agent himself to bring mm -hmm. other men to the group, but it's also women and um, we're very diverse and it's, it's wonderful that way. I'm, so. I'm not sure what you're seeing, but um, are you familiar with Tipa Snow? Uh, Definitely. They, I, I had a feeling just yeah. making, maybe your <laughs> listeners haven't T E E P A snow. Uh, she was here about three years ago and she said something which resonated uh, with dementia in particular that uh, about the time I was a caregiver or starting about one of every five caregivers was a man. Now it's like one out of every three. Wow. More and more men are stepping into that role. I see it in my groups. I see it in my clients. I had one client where it was four men, four brothers, all taking care of uh mom and then also their dad and stepmother and they were all over the country as families are nowadays mm -hmm. and we'd have individual and zoom meetings and they were pretty much all on the same page i mean just a little fine tuning and they needed some help to bring things together whether it was uh respite care or a, a housing advice or elder law you name it, we were able to get those things in place for them. So, And do you find um, knowing what questions to ask is also a challenge for a lot of new caregivers? Yeah, the old thing about you don't know what you don't know, right? Well, you don't know, and you don't know what to ask. And right. navigating a healthcare system that you're unfamiliar with is daunting. Mm -hmm. right. And having someone to, to come alongside or to walk with you or to know what questions to ask can be so helpful. And again, that's what they can gain from a support group, but also from hiring someone like yourself. But we haven't talked about that yet. We're still talking about your caregiving story. <laughs> you brought the, the healthcare system aspect, and I'm not going to get into the, uh, the kind of discussion about is either better or worse. No, they're just different between uh, the states and the provinces. Uh, they have their both have their strengths and their weaknesses, I would guess you would say, Uh but I think the biggest thing, I just uh, shared an article from Family Caregivers of BC about you're not alone. You're not, it's not you, it's the system. And that's the way people felt. When I started my journey, again, 18 years ago, plus, that I guess what I use as an example is the focus, the emphasis is on the person with the disease or the illness. Rightly so, because they can't take care of themselves or can't make their own decision. But who is saying to the caregiver, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. What support and resources do you need? And people say, you know, where's the pamphlet? Even if you get a diagnosis, right? Where's the plan? Where's the treatment? They feel let down. They feel abandoned. And I'm still hearing that today. We've come a long way, but we got so much farther to go unfortunately. You're right. I think there are more resources available and there's yes. more knowledge that there are supports out there. When I was working as a social worker in a care home, I noticed firsthand there was no support for the caregiver. And that's why fast forward for me that I became uh, someone who would support the caregiver in the community um, after I moved on from the care mm -hmm. home. But mm -hmm. yeah, there's a void and it's mm -hmm. very unfortunate. Right. The example I use is there weren't uh, online directories or even local ones. We have in uh, the, uh, the in the states in the Pacific Northwest, it's a wonderful guide called Retirement Connection, and it's online as well. But that didn't exist back then. There was hardly anything on the Internet. I mean, it was basically the old term for those who are old enough. And I think this is both countries. Let your fingers do the walking through the yellow pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what it was about. You just do it a lot and do a lot of phone calling. 
So for our younger listeners, <laughs> Google Yellow Pages. <laughs> see what the history is there. Right. Yeah, you can see Bill is doing, he's walking his fingers across the screen. <laughs> exactly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Visual here. Uh, now the problem is there are more resources or there's more information available, but it, there's also misinformation. No. Yeah. How do you know who to trust? Yeah. Right. Huge. Huge problem. And I know that uh, providing accurate and timely information is something you do. And uh, mm -hmm. fast tracking to reliable resources is also something I do. Uh, mm -hmm. Knowing what's out there and knowing what is credible is so important. And again, you can get that information through your support group. Exactly. The other caregivers have tried it and know if it works or if it doesn't mm -hmm. work. Yeah. Have you tried this? Have you contacted this resource? Uh, yeah. That's how they uh, help each other. I don't have all the answers. No, me neither. I mean, I, I may be a facilitator, but I may even give more, I probably do, more than most facilitators because I said it would be a disservice if I wasn't providing some advice and some guidance on how to handle things or where to go for some answers. I'm not just running a meeting. I feel I need to support my group. So going back to when you were full on caregiving and you had the support group and what other supports did you have when your mom was in care? So here's an interesting thing. Family is, is the first part. Okay. And I, I'll, I'll give a couple of examples. There is a, I don't know if you've heard of the Savvy Caregiver classes through the uh, Emory University, evidence-based uh, training okay. uh, for dementia. And one of the things they talk about, one, is that Family is how you define it, because that can be friends, it could be neighbors, it could be ex-coworkers, it could be your church, et cetera. And they talk about different kinds of caregiving types. So I was kind of a, a microcosm of all of them, our situation. Initially, right after the, the hurricane, family all pitched in in many different ways, whether it was money, setting up a mom with a computer again, things like that to the extent that she could do one, it was collaborative, right? It was Team Sheila, as I called it. And that became the name of my uh, fundraising, Team Sheila for the Walked and Alzheimer's. Um, then it became more, even though I was involved all along the way, it was sequential. As I mentioned, after the storm, she went to North Carolina, then Florida, then here. My aunt in New York moves out here to help take care of her and visit with her. Uh, but when you add up all those tasks that caregiving entails, whether it's the nurse, the, the, the caregiver, the, uh, the financial, the bookkeeper, the, the laundry, the cook, you name it, bottle washer, uh, <laughs> you wear many, many, many hats. And that fell upon me because there was so much in the aftermath of the storm, real estate, taxes, finances, legal, you name it. I, I was handling it, even though my family was helping me quite a bit. In a lot of ways, my wife helped me. She wasn't directly involved. She supported me so I could take care of my mom, which was mm -hmm. wonderful. And then the other types. So I was the solitary caregiver, sort of, but with help from others. Then you have like the uneasy alliance or the observed, which is people who are not involved to some extent. And they may say things like, oh, I'm too busy, or I can't deal with it, I'm not. I'm too far away, etc. Although there's a lot of things people can do from a distance, mm -hmm. like help order things, or to handle the finances, or to come in for a week and give respite. There's a lot of things. You, you don't have to be directly involved with the hands-on caregiving 24-7 or full-time. Uh, or they are providing unsolicited advice, mm -hmm. misinformed thoughts. And I have two recommendations for people when that happens. And I'll make sure I mention what my aunts uh, did in that case. Uh, one is if they have advice like that, or you'd like to get their help and they're not, and they're saying, oh, you ought to do this, you ought to do that. You know, that's a great idea. Why don't you take that on? Yeah. And one of two things are going to happen, which are probably both good. One, they're going to shut up, leave you alone, and you can do what you want to. Or two, they'll do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can do that. Yeah. Right? Now, the other is, if they provide, especially 
uninformed advice, misguided, you can say, that's a good idea. I'll consider it. And then ignore it. If it's not in your loved one with dementia's best interest, right. ignore it. In the case of my two aunts, I had plenty of opinions. I listened. I knew that they had my mom's best interest at heart, and they knew I did as well. But that my name was on the paper. Hmm. I was power of attorney and everything else. And they knew I was going to make the right decision after considering what they said. So it worked for us. Not everybody works that way. Um, and we can talk about this more later. And that's part of the reason why I became a trained elder mediator, because some families can't even agree on ordering pizza, let yeah, alone yeah. how and where and who to take care of their loved one. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, that, uh, that way of handling someone with good ideas or thinking that their ideas are great and you should do this. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. Great idea. How about you take it on? Love that. Love mm -hmm. it. Well, as the saying goes, uh, uh, we can say it this way, they were shooting all over themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you had supportive family. Mm -hmm. You had the support group. Yes. Were you uh, able to yeah. take care of yourself? Let me give you another example of uh, support. And okay. sometimes... And I definitely we'll get into self-care because that was an important component. I didn't want to lose track of this. You know, people will say to us all the time, how can I help? What kind of help do you need? And too often we'll say, I'm fine. I don't need it. Or you just can't think of what at that moment. A good thing for people to do, and I think this came out of the uh, savvy caregiver as well, is make a list of all those jobs that you do, like I rattled off, and then some. And when somebody asks, is there something you need? Is there something way I can help? Hey, yeah, you know, you've got a kid, a, a teenager. Can you mow our lawn? Hey, can you go pick up the prescription at the pharmacy for us? Little things, that's one less thing you need to do. Exactly. So, Because a lot of people, if they're friends and if they care, they'd love to do that. They just don't know how to help. Yeah. Of course, you know, bottom line, you could just say, um, or what they can do is bring you a dinner, bring you a casserole. I mean, who goes to a house and empty handed, right? <laughs> <laughs> or they shouldn't. So here's my little example. It was right towards the end when mom was in hospice. Last couple of weeks, another norovirus quarantine at the facility. Unfortunately, they do happen. The care was exceptional. The coffee was institutional. Uh -huh, gotcha. <laughs> This is like only two or three days before she passed away. And my aunt and I were the only ones who were allowed in the building besides the residents and the staff. I get on social media and said, can somebody please bring me a mocha latte? <laughs> two different friends from two different coffee places show up at the front desk with that coffee for me. Nice. Perfect. I knew who they were and I thank them to this day because yeah. it meant a lot. All I had to do was ask and I knew what kind of friends I had. So, I mean, that's one small example, but there's so many other ways that people can help or ways we can ask. But it meant a lot to you at that time. Like it's what you needed. Right. Absolutely. Yep. People are very supportive. Uh, it doesn't always work that way. And unfortunately, too often caregivers are solitary and they can get burned out, sick or worse. I don't know if you've heard this statistic. It's something like for dementia caregivers, over the age of 70, about two-thirds pre-decease the person they're caring for. Yeah, wow. That is tragic, and it's preventable. But people don't take those steps to take care of themselves as well. Oxygen mask, you know, those analogies. Mm -hmm. So you asked about self-care. What became mm -hmm. very important to me, besides the support group, and getting counseling, using my benefits to see a therapist who was perfect for me. She had the same background. She had an HR background. Oh, I didn't mention while I was working full-time for the state, I had a micromanager, narcissistic boss from hell. So no. you can imagine where my stress level, my blood. That's a little high. <laughs> Just a little high. So I had to do things like that with the group and counseling, but also more physically, more day-to-day, -day, I would get away from my desk get out and walk, even if it was for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I would, what started at 
a chair massage there in the building, I started seeing getting a full massage on a regular basis. I saw that as not a luxury, but it became a necessity. Gotcha. Right. So uh, that was one thing. Uh, I tried to exercise as much as I could, try to get enough sleep. I'm very honest. I had a little medication to take that edge off because between the stress of taking care of mom and dealing with that horrible boss, I got really close to losing my job because I would have opened my mouth and said something I regretted later, mm -hmm. but I could not afford to do that. Mm -hmm. So, and even though I had hundreds of hours of sick leave, I still got in the States Family Medical Leave Act to protect my job just in case. So I, it was one less thing I had oh, to work. That's good. Yeah. And then I could at least do what I needed to, to take care of my mom. Yeah. That's so really good. That was important. And to take care of yourself. Exactly. So I also, when uh, mom passed away, that person retired mm -hmm. themselves because their own poor health and my stress level and my blood pressure came right down to normal. Both at the same time. Yeah. 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 Just boom, boom. A few months after mom, that person left. And the last couple of years I was there were tolerable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, it wasn't fulfilling, but it paid the rent. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you an idea though. Have you ever seen those apps where you do a countdown on your phone? Oh, yeah. For yeah. retirement or for Christmas or yeah, anything. Birthday, a trip, yeah. whatever. Yeah. yeah. I did a retirement countdown. I didn't give two weeks. I didn't give two months. I gave <laughs> two years notice and I had a plan on my phone. <laughs> and people would ask, so how many days, hours, minutes, and seconds? Because they knew I knew exactly how long I had checked out mentally. I mean, yeah. I did my job, but yeah. So, and I had, still have a snapshot of that zero 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 seconds that when I was done <laughs> it sounds to me like you were very close to burnout yeah it was very close yeah I'd never envisioned I mean whoever says when they're growing up I want to work at motor vehicles right <laughs> nobody but uh it did give me a good retirement mm -hmm. and so I can't complain about that mm -hmm. yeah yeah. And it taught you skills. Like you said, you, you knew facilitating mm -hmm. already. So you knew things that you could carry on into mm -hmm. your post work. And yeah. as you facilitate support groups now, that's. And exactly. That's and as I mentioned, I'm doing elder mediation. I thought back to the things that I have done that are similar when I was my, my family, I won't get into the details. <laughs> I was the peacemaker. I was the guy in the middle who was trying to get everybody together and stop arguing with each other. And then I facilitated meetings at work and then I facilitate the support group. So it's a natural transition to go into mediation and just help people come to a decision when they're at an impasse. Well, I always said as a social worker, if families were not dysfunctional, I wouldn't have a job. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Bill, did you have, do you have siblings? So that was a little bit part of the story because people would say to me, do you have any siblings, Bill? Because I don't see any presence of one helping out. It was probably better that he was not involved. I have a brother who is three and a half years younger. He has some issues. He had a very complicated enabling uh, codependent uh, relationship with my mom. I'll say that she was an artist. He was a musician. Mm -hmm. They were very close in a complicated way. Gotcha. Uh, it was better that she didn't give him power of attorney. Uh, and he was pretty much unable to help from his, he was at a distance and he didn't have the means to be helpful. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, because he wasn't here, especially at the end, uh, that it was harder for him emotionally. Uh, the last time he saw her, I have a picture that I used. It's iconic picture from the memory care unit. And it shows me and, and my mother looking at each other is like seven, eight months before she passed away. I said to my brother, you need to come now because otherwise she won't remember you. Mm -hmm. After taking that picture, he sits down in front of her. She says, there you are. Where have you been? So it made the trip worthwhile. Very Needless to say, he lost it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> he just fell apart. Yeah. You know, very emotional. It made the trip worthwhile. Yeah. But he wasn't around. So at the celebration of life, 
uh, in May of 2013, he was uh, he was really choked up. He had a hard time getting through his little talk. Mm. Yeah, it's tough. So I, you know, relied upon other family members. Like I said, I had an aunt who moved out here from Manhattan. She actually stayed in the, in our area after mom passed away. And we would take turns going to see mom in the in memory care and keep her company and to make sure she was getting the care that she needed. Yeah, we could advocate for her. So I'm very, very grateful for her for doing that. And then the other aunt took care of her uh, back in Florida, you know, before she moved out here. So I'm very grateful. And I say that to them periodically. You see what I'm doing now, but it, I couldn't have gotten through that time period without you all. Uh, another example is when I said my mom had to go over to memory care yeah. uh, because she was wandering, ex exit seeking. My wife and I took turns for two weeks spending the night with mom. During the daytime, she was an adult day program. So we could each go to work taking turns. And I barely saw her for two weeks because we were just like ships passing in the night. When I was home getting some sleep and getting a shower, she was with mom and vice versa. And then when she was at work, I was at work. Yeah, it was tough. So I'm eternally grateful. It. Yeah. And it takes a team. It does. Exactly. And it's interesting yeah. that I even say, and, and everybody has to make their own decision about, are you going to care for them at home? Are you going to put them in a care facility, et cetera? You may not be able to make that promise if they say, don't ever put me in a home because you may not be able to handle that financially, physically, et cetera. I do say that if my mom, except for some short periods, had lived with us, I might be divorced today. Wow. It, it would have put, I think, way too much strain. They had a difficult relationship. But it took one time, I think it was, I know it was after mom moved out here. I think it was before she went to memory care. She said to my wife, I know there's something wrong with me. I'm sorry to be such a burden. That changed my wife's thinking and viewpoint saying, I felt sorry for her. I felt compassion. Mm -hmm. And she softened after that. Wow. Yeah. That's insight for your mom. Yeah. Like, especially when she's having cognitive issues. Right. Because usually they're fighting it. Oh, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. You know, what dementia? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't use that word anyway. I, I once heard somebody say the term, your brain or your memory is aging a little faster than the rest of you. Oh, I like that. I do too. It's softer. It is. Yeah. Your memory is aging faster than the rest yeah. of you. Mm -hmm. I have to remember mm -hmm. that. I'll go write that yeah. down. Because what it's, what it's going to be if you say, oh, you have dementia, you have Alzheimer's, you have Lewy body. Yeah, no, I don't. I'm fine. You know, or it's going to freak them out. It is scary. Yeah. I mean, when you think about disabilities, handicaps, losing vision, losing hearing, losing a limb versus losing your cognitive ability, nobody is going to say, oh, I don't mind losing my cognitive. That would be the last thing. That would be the scariest. I know I would be. Well, that's a pretty decent story. <laughs> pretty involved. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> uh, yeah. Be careful what I ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. And so now you are providing supports and services to folks. And you've talked about facilitating the support groups. And I just learned about your memory cafes. <laughs> so could you speak about those? They sound brilliant. They sound lovely. Mm -hmm. We'd love to tell you about it because there's a little story. I remember with the um, uh, support groups, there were at least a couple of the spouses who would say to theirs, said, are you talking about me? Why can't I come? And mm -hmm. so they, the spouses, the caregiver would say, is there something we can do together? I said, yes. Uh, besides, at the time, there was the um, early stage programs like art programs, things like that with the Alzheimer's Association. I'm pretty sure they have that Alzheimer's Society as well. We have minds in motion there we go. up here. Thank you very much. Yeah. And so I said, you know, we can try something. It's called the Memory Cafe. And it is uh, for both of you, except it would be no, maybe no further advanced than mild cognitive impairment, MCI, or early stage dementia. And some groups do something similar every time. They'll do like socializing, music, 
refreshments, dancing, that type of thing. I try to do something a little something every month, something different. And it could be anywhere from uh, memory puzzles, like uh, if you've ever heard of memory joggers, it comes from dementia. Yes. Map. Right. Yeah. So like, yeah, uh, finish this sentence. A rolling stone gathers no moss. moss. Right. A penny save is a penny earned. Right. And even for somebody with early stage dementia, they may not remember what they had for breakfast, but they'll finish those sentences and their care partner will be delighted to say, oh, that's how they used to be. There's still something there, which is true. They are themselves. They're not themselves, but they're still themselves inside. And that's old memory. So we do other things like that. The other, uh, the last time we did a game called, and I think this comes from Golden Carers, about have you ever, like, have you ever ridden an elephant or a horse or something, yeah. ridden in a plane? I changed it to seaplane, um, things like that. And in an hour, we only got through four questions because we had so many good stories. I don't want to just hear yes or no. Tell me a story. Yeah. Tell me about when you did that, right? Yeah. So Golden Carers is a great resource as well. Yes, exactly. So uh, Memory Joggers and Golden Carers, mm -hmm. both great. Uh, another uh, resource that I have given many times to clients and occasionally in the support group, and I tell people about it, uh, Rachel Wonderland with Dementia by Day. She has a podcast. She's a gerontologist in Pennsylvania. Uh, and she has some really good stuff, including three books. She has a lot of experience in care facilities, primarily memory care. Uh, and one of her books is called Creative Engagement. And there's a lot of great ideas, whether it's somebody is at home or in a care facility. And so I, I, I recommend that to people. Great recommendations because sharing activities when your loved one still can participate, mm -hmm. maybe not as involved as you would like, but still can contribute mm -hmm. and participate is, I think it's a gift. And the important thing is whatever activity that they do or you do with them, and it's just the same as any task, like putting away the dishes or uh, setting the table, it doesn't matter how they did it, if they did it correctly or if they do it how you did it, it's that they are keeping engaged, they're active, they're keeping busy, and it gives you a little break to maybe be making dinner, right? So a lot of people forget that. Uh, just let that go. Let that bleep go. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't matter how well they do it. No, our standard has to change, mm -hmm. but our goal is the same. Mm -hmm. Involvement and, and making, making them feel whole. Mm -hmm. Right. Like it can even be a puzzle. It could be dominoes. It could be anything like that. And again, it doesn't matter how well they do it or correctly, but that they're keeping active mentally, physically, and socially. Yeah. Just like the rest of us, everybody else, we want as good quality of life for as long as possible. We do. Mm -hmm. So, Bill, this is amazing. And how can folks reach you if they want to find out mm -hmm. more? So uh, as a caregiving support consultant, I provide advice, support, resources, and referrals, help people uh, take care of their loved one, uh, manage the care, practice self-care and prevention, hopefully, uh, and to collaborate with the care team and coordinate the care plan. And so my website is Cohen, C-O-H-E-N, caregivingsupport.com. And it talks about uh, how I help people, how I work, uh, also about my elder mediation, testimonials, all that good stuff, including my social media, that type of thing. I give it also on uh, most of the platforms, uh, particularly, I mean, it's obviously my name, Bill Cohen on Facebook. Uh, I'm also on Instagram and TikTok. I do at least one video a week, no dancing. Okay. <laughs> except except <laughs> a fellow caregiver, social worker, therapist in Toronto. I say that right? Toronto? <laughs> Toronto <laughs> or me, Toronto? Yeah, yeah, she talked me into doing little side-by-side seven-second dance thing because I told her, no, I won't. Yes, you are. And I had the most views of any video I've ever done. <laughs> 
Well done. That's awesome. I won't. Yeah, that's not me. So good for you. So that I'm on those at Cohen Caregiving Support. And I do have a also a virtual support group on Facebook called uh, Dementia Support Group for Caregivers with Bill Cohen. That's my okay. community. So we have monthly conversation with somebody in the industry uh, and sharing their thoughts and uh, expertise. So people have to apply to get into that, uh, to join? They, they have have join, to to and join. they can be anything from a caregiver, past or present. It can be somebody who's a service provider or just somebody who wants to learn more. And as long as there's no agendas, there's no try to promote and sell, uh, yeah, they'll pass the uh, the litmus test. And I just keep an eye on that. I'm very protective because it has to be confidential and safe, just like a real support group. So it's easy. It's You can find it as a public group but it is private to join. So do you conduct an actual session or is it just ongoing questions and support? The latter. It's an ongoing, okay. yeah. Not just myself, but other uh, people are always posting and then uh, other members will provide support or ideas or suggestions and what they can do or just compassion, empathy. Compassion. Yeah, I, I've read some, not... Yeah, like I've reached the end of my rope yeah. and then you get all of mm. these very supportive responses. Right. And and then I will do, you know, regular posts as well, keep things rolling. Mm -hmm. Very kind. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that, and it goes along with uh, an international business group that I am a part of that is in several countries and doing other podcasts, like as you heard me say, from New England to New Zealand. but also, in the Facebook group, we have members from, I'm pretty sure, all states and most of the provinces and all six continents, except for Antarctica. I haven't found a penguin there yet. <laughs> oh, you never know. So that's pretty gratifying as well. Oh, I bet. Mm -hmm. it's a lot of that's pretty far reaching. Right. Well, Very cool. But people need support everywhere, and especially in rural areas. I mean, it's easier to find resources and support in metropolitan areas or uh, cities, but you get out in the middle of nowhere, it's really hard to find. So that's why if I get somebody who joins us in my weekly group virtually, that's great because I can support them from anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Could you talk about some of the other types of support that you provide, Bill? Let me give you an example of a family that I helped with mediation, but also with how to care for their loved one. I had four siblings, completely divided, half and half. Two wanted to go one direction, two wanted the other. They were completely at an impasse. Between individual conversations with each of the siblings and mom, and I met with her in person as well. She, for a while, was in the Portland area. I got a feeling for what everybody wanted, what their priorities were. And then we would talk as a group. Now, it almost fell apart many times as we're discussing these things. Because a couple of wanted her to stay where she was. The other wanted to go to one of the siblings and take care of her there. And I remember... At one point, one of the siblings said, well, at least we're not yelling at each other. We kept talking and talking until we came to an agreement. The gentleman who's here in the Portland area who hired me at one point was even off screen and muted and just sitting there listening. He was not happy with the result. And unfortunately, with mediation, nobody's going to get everything they want. Right, but they can get something they can live with. That's the idea of, of mediation. And I don't make the decision for them. And I told them I'm not a therapist. I can't make the decision for you. And I can't fix your family problems, right? But I kept them talking. So they came to a settlement. Even though he was not happy with the decision, he wrote me a glowing testimonial. You did a great job. Oh. You did what we expected you to do or what we needed you to do. And right. It was something he could live with. At least mom was safe. She was getting good care. And that's all you can expect. 
So that mediation is really good because you, you step back, you provide an objective view of what's really going on. You listen to each person separately mm -hmm. so that they could be completely honest with yes. you. And then you brought them together to discuss. Exactly. And uh, the ultimate goal is mom's safe care mm -hmm. and what mom wants. And uh, yeah, that does sound like it was successful. It was, it was, and very gratifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And folks need that. Like uh, if you aren't getting along with your siblings, if you aren't understanding what the overall goal is, it's really important to get outside help sometimes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Need somebody objective. And it keeps them out of the courts because what if they had brought in lawyers and gone to court it would have been very expensive and timely while mom's just getting worse and worse and worse and probably saying, why are my kids, you know, arguing here and she or doesn't understand why is everybody all upset? So yeah, that's what we try to do. That's very good. Very kind. Mm -hmm. So is there one personal story you'd like to share to our listeners well, with our personal listeners? story? go with this and I love to tell little things about my mom at her expense because she's not around I'm not she's unaware and it's it's a little bit of advice too so she loved movies but uh the last time I took her to a movie I spent half the time going to the bathroom oh so we missed it I had to watch it later on Netflix I don't even remember what the movie was <laughs> doesn't matter uh so she was always asking me are there any good movies out there or can we go see a good movie i would just say whatever movie popped into my head i'll do, use a little improv titanic gone with the wind butch cassidy you know anything like that and one she's getting an answer she doesn't know any different it's causing no harm I'm keeping my sanity and I'm having a little laugh at mom's expense. Mm. <laughs> it worked. So taking her to a movie and um, spending all of your time in the bathroom, that's just not fun. <laughs> nope. Yeah. And of course, all I could do uh, in a situation like that, just like when I flew, I went back to Florida and brought her here by plane is I couldn't go into the women's room. Or, you know, get try to get into that small airplane bathroom with her. Right. So I had to kind of like hope she would be okay. I'd see somebody coming out of the ladies' room. I said, you see a little woman, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, don't worry. She's fine. She'll be right out. Uh, it was challenging. I mean, if I had to, I would have gone right at her. Sorry, man. Man incoming. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's again, um, the male caregiver. Yes. Right. And men do things differently. We are usually not in that nurturing, caregiving, or caretaking role. Fortunately, I think my mother is a reason why I'm a strong nurturer. Mm -hmm. And men, one, they tend not as much to go to support groups, get counseling. I'm fine. I can handle it. They look at it as a job. They look at it as a task, a series of things to do. I can do this. I can handle it. And I think, again, that's changing. I think... The younger men are so uh, rigid in that thinking that they can't do that kind of role. They can't take care of their aging parents, uh, showing emotion, opening up in a group. I think we're seeing some changes going on there, which is a good thing, because it should not mm -hmm. just always fall to the women in the family. What if there is no woman? <laughs> a good point. Mm -hmm. Very good. And not, and that doesn't yeah. mean the, the daughter-in-law either. <laughs> yes. No. Mm -hmm. So, Bill, this has been really good information, and I thank you. And I, I just hope that folks listen to the fact that you were doing this for a while, and you have learned that there are supports that you can provide now from the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate it. It's been, uh, I, I welcomed this opportunity, and it's been nice to be able to share with you and just enjoyed our conversation, period. Thank you. I did, too. Take care. You, too. Bill's encore career in caregiving support showcases his deep commitment to caregivers. His role as a mediator brings harmony to families, 
while his monthly memory cafe provides a communal space for caregivers and their loved ones. As a certified senior advisor, caregiving support consultant, and Alzheimer's advocate, Bill helps folks manage the challenging journey with dementia. So it's accurate to say he has found his purpose. Add to all this Bill's insight as a male caregiver, which helps him relate to and understand other male caregivers, including those caring for female recipients, especially in public washroom situations. Whether male or female, if you are feeling let down and abandoned in your caregiving experience, take heart and check out the Virtual Dementia Support Group for Caregivers with Bill Cohen on Facebook, as Bill recognizes caregivers everywhere need support. And if you are in the midst of your own caregiving journey and need some supports, I invite you to tap into alongside caregiverconsulting.ca or cohencaregivingsupport.com. If you'd like to share your story as a guest on the Island Treasures podcast, please contact me by email at alongsidecaregiverconsulting at shaw.ca. And thank you for tuning in today and to Bill Cohen for sharing your caregiving experience and insights and for what you do now to support caregivers. If you don't want to miss future episodes, be sure to subscribe to the Island Treasures podcasts. See you next episode. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time.